Okay, great. Let's get started. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. You may not be able to tell based on the snow yesterday, but we are in full spring mode, ready to start gardening despite the snow. My name is Emily and I work with WWF's Nature Connected Communities team and I'm going to be your MC today. So thank you for joining us for our Garden for Wildlife webinar series. This is the fifth webinar that we're doing. So over the past three weeks, our experts have talked to you about how to plan your garden, how to actually get start planting, and how to take care of your garden round, year round. So for the next 90 minutes today, our expert panel is gonna be talking about how your garden can contribute to citizen science. So spending time in our gardens is one thing that we can do to connect with nature, but did you know all of the creatures that you spot in your garden that come by are also indicators of biodiversity? And the number of plants and the type of plants that you grow can help us to better understand how much natural habitat there is in your area. And when we add all of that information together, data from other gardeners, it tells us a story of where we've been and where we need to go to build healthy, thriving ecosystems for birds, bees, butterflies, frogs, and other species that depend on our homegrown habitats. So this is why citizen science is so important and what we'll be delving into a bit more today. So as you know, this is our fifth webinar and we hope that you've been able to join them. If you haven't, you can watch past episodes on our YouTube channel. We post them there about 48 hours after. And as you can see, we have two more webinars coming up in the series. The first one is happening this Saturday where author Lorraine Johnson is gonna come back and talk to us about native, well, ed edible native plants. And then this is a new webinar that we've just added. Um, we'll be speaking with Dr. Doug Talami about his new book, Nature's Best Hope. And I also just want to give a special thanks to our partners. Um, in the Zone is a collaboration between WWF Canada and Carolinian Canada. And what we do is we work with thousands of gardeners across the Carolinian Zone to grow native plant habitat so that wildlife can thrive. And we do this in partnership with Loblaw as well. They've been a big supporter of the program and have partnered with local growers across Ontario to make native plants with the In the Zone garden tag available in 35 select stores. So you can visit our website, inthezonegardens.ca, and you'll be able to find a list of what Loblaw stores are carrying those plants, as well as a list of other native plant nurseries. And also, I'd just like to give a quick bit of housekeeping about how Q&A works. So you'll be able to see a Q&A box um, down on your menu bar and you can type your questions in there rather than in the chat. And during the presentation, our um, experts will be answering your questions live in the Q&A. And if you see one of your questions flagged as answer live, that means that we'll be answering it live at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. So now on to our experts. I'm delighted to introduce you to our panel of experts who bring decades of experience in native plant gardening as well as wildlife conservation. So first I wanna introduce you to Yarmila Bechka Lee. She manages our In the Zone Gardens program which strives to increase Canadians' engagement with nature. She's been with WWF Canada for more than 23 years and has worked on a variety of conservation initiatives including advising Loblaw on their 100% sustainable seafood commitment and managing WWF's Endangered Species Recovery Fund. So Yarmila, I have a question for you to kick things off. What is your favorite part of gardening with native plants? Thanks, Emily. Uh, well, aside from knowing that I'm creating great habitat for our wildlife, I really love the idea of putting a uh, young plant in the ground and then watching it grow and uh, get more comfortable in my garden and seeing how it uh, interacts with the other plants and just creates a, a, a more interesting habitat in my yard. 
Thank you, Yarmila. And I'd also like to introduce everybody to Ryan Godfrey. He is WWF Canada's resident botanist, and he's also on the North American Native Plant Society's board. So Ryan, have you made any biological observations from your balcony recently that you'd like to share? Yes, well, so I have a little uh, routine that I do in the morning. I like to take my coffee, I go out, um, and I just sort of sit there until nature surprises me with something. And it, it generally does happen if I wait long enough. And uh, just a couple of mornings ago, I heard a call. I did not see the bird, but it was a, um, a white-throated sparrow. So that was a, kind of a nice one to, to hear, not a common one for me. Yeah. Great, that's so exciting. I love spouting different kinds of birds. Um, and our next um, expert I'd like to introduce you to is Pete Ewens. He is WWF Canada's lead species specialist. During his more than 20 years with WWF Canada, Pete has led conservation programs for Arctic wildlife and now is focusing on ecological restoration in urban settings where he can help Canadians connect with nature and restore it in their own neighborhoods. So Pete, you're trained in the scientific fields of ecology. So what is the best part of being a citizen scientist? Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's actually what goes on, not in here, but down in my heart. <laughs> I know it's sacrilegious for scientists to say that. I'm reasonably well trained, but the big key to a sustainable planet is actually what goes on in your heart. And that is what gardening for wildlife and with wildlife that share the same space as we do. That's what it's all about. And that's the big turnkey moment for us and human society right now. It's emotional. Hey, thank you. Pete. Mm. That's very inspiring. Um, and our last expert on the panel today is Ben Porchak. He is an ecologist with Carolinian Canada who has more than 20 years of experience. He has a garden in London, Ontario that has more than 200 native plant species and also an incredible water feature. Um, ben, I would like to ask you, what is the oddest experience you have had in your native plant garden? Thanks, Emily, and hi, everybody. Well, I, I spend a lot of time in my backyard when I'm on meetings, often phone meetings, and I've seen a lot of interesting bird behavior. I once saw an osprey chasing a bald eagle that swooped down really close to me as I was walking in my backyard. Over the, the early winter, there are often tundra swans that migrate right over our city. And I'll hear their call and run outside into the backyard and I can see a bunch migrating overhead. Uh, but uh, the oddest of all was when I was on a phone call and I was talking and an American crow dropped out of the sky and landed at my feet. And I thought, oh, I'll pick it up. But of course it could run. So I chased it around the entire backyard. I finally picked it up and realized that it had a bruised wing and uh, I healed it for a couple of weeks. Um, it, I used to work at the Wild Bird Clinic at the University of Guelph, so I have a bit of experience. And um, it loved everybody in the family, but it's captor me. And it would throw anything and everything at me. And I was so grateful to finally let it go. That is so funny. Thank you for sharing that, Ben. And I'm going to pass it over to Yarmila, who can give us some background on native plants and why they are so important. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone for joining us today. Um, for the webinar series that we've been running, Garden for Wildlife, has really focused on uh, the idea of using native plants to create better habitat for wildlife. And native plants are those that have been in the area, in the local area, for thousands of years and have co evolved spe into special relationships with the wildlife there. Um, so the next few slides are several slides actually, are going to give you a bit of a background on why this is important. And it might seem a bit familiar to some of you who have tuned in for previous uh, webinars. So um, thanks for your patience, but we think this bears repeating. So at WWF, we talk about the um, dual crises of massive biodiversity loss, as well as global climate change, both of which have happened in a relatively short um, recent uh, time period. And of course, added to that, we have the um, 
COVID-19 pandemic in recent months. So these crises have a profound impact on us as humans, but also the plants and animals that share the landscape with us. But we know through science that there are nature-based solutions that can help mitigate the impacts of these crises. And one of the simplest ones, uh, one of the simplest nature-based solutions is planting native plants. And by putting habitat back to where it's needed, we not only improve biodiversity outcomes, but also uh, the native plants help to absorb carbon from the atmosphere. And by restoring fragmented and degraded landscapes, we're really helping to bring about more of a balance uh, in, our, in our landscapes. And we call this Growing Canada's Biggest Wildlife Garden. And we'd like to invite you to join us in doing that. Next slide, please. There are seven uh, eco zones, terrestrial eco zones across southern, on uh, sorry, southern Canada, where uh, about 90% of Canadians live. And during our presentation, we're going to be drilling down a little bit more into the orange one at the bottom, um, the mixed wood plains eco zone, and specifically talking about the Carolinian zone in that area. But really the concept of using native plants is ap applicable everywhere across Canada because there are local native plants and animals interacting with those right across Canada and anywhere in especially in urban and peri-urban um, situations this is really key. Next slide please. So southern Ontario's Carolinian zone is really actually the northern edge of a unique assemblage of plants and animals that come up through the US from the Carolinas and is Canada's biodiversity hotspot. We have the highest number of uh, species of animals and plants here. We also have one third of Canada's species at risk. So um, it, it is a um, area that needs a lot of attention. Um, it's actually also a tiny part of Canada. It's less than 1% of Canada's entire land mass. And coupled with the fact that 25% um, of Canadians live in this area, uh, you can imagine that the impacts on biodiversity are pretty, pretty intense. Next slide, please. The challenge in the Carolinian zone is to get our habitat levels, our healthy functioning ecosystems up to 30%. You can see the dark areas in green um, in the Carolinian zone are uh, not that many there. They're mostly conservation areas, federally and provincially protected parks, uh, as well as some First Nations lands. Um, but those don't uh, come near the 30% that we need of healthy habitat to have fully functioning ecosystems across this region. Uh, because the uh, Carolinian zone is, the land in it is 95% privately owned, this presents a huge opportunity for people like you and me to make a difference um, as we you know, work to restoring and enhancing that habitat. Next slide, please. So to meet the challenge in the Carolinian zone, WWF and Carolinian Canada uh, came together about three, four years ago to create the program in the zone, which is all about getting um, homeowners and other landowners to uh, create healthy habitat on their, on their land. And we're thrilled to say that we now have actually over 5,000 people uh, involved in the program. Uh, through the um, citizen science portal that we have, we know that we have about 28,000 hectares of land that um, are being managed through the program. And we also have over 60,000 native plants that can be found on that land. So these are some of the um, statistics and information that we have been able to gather and we'll get into some more details later in the presentation. Next slide, please. 
Okay, uh, we talked about why native plants are so beneficial to wildlife, but they're also beneficial to humans and people who garden um, won't have to use pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers the same way you would for um, exotic uh, species because the plants that you're putting in are so well adapted to the local conditions. Similarly, you won't need to water them as much after they're well established because they're quite um, adept at getting the water needs they need. Uh, for example, lots of prairie species have very deep roots that tap into the water uh, in the ground and that helps them survive drought conditions in certain areas of southern Ontario. And this translates to saved costs, of course, um, but it also um, provides shade and um, when you put in shrubs and trees that will help with cooling costs in the summer. Um, high volume water events are, are not um, as bad with lots of native plants and, and lots of green biomass in the environment because those plants are able to absorb it instead of having it run off into the uh, sewer system. And of course, carbon storage, biodiversity and ecosystem resilience are all improved by more native plants in the ground. And uh, finally, of course, as Pete mentioned earlier, it's the, it's the human connection and the well-being that we get from interacting with nature that's really quite important, uh, especially in recent months when we've all had to um, socially distance from each other. Next slide, please. So this wonderful looking creature is the curve-lined owlet caterpillar. And it was taken by Doug Ptolemy, who um, is going to be joining us for our um, seventh webinar next week. And it's really put in here because it's a reminder for us that more than ever, we need nature. Uh, these amazing creatures are ones that are found uh, in the lower portions of the food chains, uh, but they're in steep decline. At the same time, these food chains form the complex food webs that we humans rely on. And so we can help put back some of those native plants these insects rely on for their well being uh, by improving our landscape and uh, putting them back into our habitats. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite parts about planting native plants and in the zone. It, it's really simple. You plant the right plant in the right spot and the wildlife will find it. The wildlife that need it will find it. We were, had a wonderful experience when creating a native plant garden down in Windsor a few years ago. And uh, we were putting in some wetland plants around uh, a sewer grate and or drainage uh, grate. And literally within minutes of putting one of those plants down, out of nowhere, there appeared a dragonfly. And we just thought that was amazing because the area we were in was surrounded by asphalt and concrete and just plain turf. So not much, um, not much biodiversity in the plant world there, but for some reason that, um, that beautiful dragonfly knew what it was looking for and just came out and uh, spent some time with us that afternoon. So that was really inspiring. Next slide, please. The other great thing about native plants and in the zone is that you don't need your a typical uh, suburban backyard to join the program and create healthy habitat for wildlife. Uh, you can have a balcony garden, a boulevard garden, or no garden, want to start from scratch and to put in something green and living in your area. And the best part is that even just one plant makes a difference and it's so easy for anybody to help out in creating healthy habitat. Next slide, please. Right, so the topic of our uh, webinar today is monitoring and citizen science in your garden. And we're going to walk you through four different aspects of that from observing and recording. Uh, we'll talk more about the garden tracker and responding to the changes that you see and we'll also talk about some of the citizen science portals available uh, for you to participate in. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Ryan. Thanks, Yarmila. Yeah, so we're going to talk about how to become a citizen scientist. Um, so citizen science has a, a long history. Um, one of the biggest projects that people might be familiar with is the Christmas bird count, which goes on all around the world, people counting and observing um, birds all on the same day. And the reason this is so important is because biology really fundamentally comes down to observations, a collection of lots and lots of observations. And, you know, field workers can do that, undergraduates could do that, but so much better if we're all doing that together and collectively piling tons and tons of of observations all together. And those can be observations about plants and animals, evidently. It could be about the weather, astronomy, all sorts of different things count as citizen science. But here today, we're talking about the biological side of things. Next slide, please. Um, another thing that you can, you can track is not just what's in your garden, but, but what you are doing in your garden. And this, this may end up being useful for you as you're keeping records so that you can see, oh, okay, I planted last year, I planted on the third week of May, and this year, okay, the third week is coming up, so maybe I should start thinking about it. So think when you're keeping those records and that journaling, um, you can include whatever you would like, including maybe your budget or any kind of observation or anything. You could be as fastidious as you would like, really. Whatever is um, interesting to you will help you become a better gardener and a better steward. And you can do that any time of year, obviously. Next slide, please. Tools. Um, some tools are very important. Um, in the top, you'll see a hand lens. and I've got mine here. Oh, it's sort of disappearing. This is my little jeweler's loop. Um, I use this all the time to, to get a bug's eye view of my plants because, you know, it's always important to remember plants, they don't really care what we think of them. Their, their shape and structures are all about what insects see. So if you, if you can take a close look, you can start to understand their world. Um, up in the top right is an example of one of these that you can actually strap onto your phone and then get um, close magnified pictures. Um, which is another important type of record. Uh, there are many, many different types of field guides that you can use, and these are very important tools for being able to figure out just what you're seeing. And of course, if birds are your thing, um, binoculars will be really useful. And by the way, I learned, somebody taught me, you can flip your binoculars uh, backwards and look into them and they can make, you can use them as a, as a makeshift hand lens um, if you prefer or if that's all you've got. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take one moment to focus in on a particular um, citizen science app that I really like using, which is iNaturalist. And what I love about this one is that at the same time, you, you can use this app to teach yourself about plants and at the same time or animals or insects or whatever it is you're observing and at the same time you're contributing to a gigantic database that researchers are using and actually publishing so this is just sort of their general flow but it's very simple you download the app you take make an account you take some photos and this very impressive um, algorithm will figure out um, what it thinks you're looking at. And then there's this sort of back and forth between different members of the community as you discuss, oh, does it look like this or does it look like that? And in that discussion, it's basically a social network for nerds um, to figure out what they're looking at. Um, and it's a really cool thing. So if you're just thinking of dipping your little toe into citizen science, I actually would recommend that you use this version of iNaturalist, which is called Seek. And that's just a little bit simpler um, than the full iNaturalist, but in no time you'll be getting onto the full thing and contributing hundreds of observations, I'm sure. Next slide, please. So another thing that's really important to that you can notice is um, is where plants are being found. And this can be either in your garden. I've mentioned in previous episodes that native plants have an adorable tendency to sort of move themselves around in your garden. So it can be kind of neat to, um, to see from one year to the next where things are going. Oh yeah, we've got a poll coming up. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Okay. Let's see what people think about this. 
Um, and meanwhile, this, this slide also reminded me of if invasive species and tracking the spread of invasive species is something that you'd be interested to contribute to, um, there's an organization called EdMaps, and we'll have the link to that at the end of the presentation, which is really all about people photographing and documenting the, the spread of various invasive species, including plants and insects. And it, this is a really important thing. And, and um, if you can help, help scientists understand where invasive species are and where they aren't, it, it could be a really big deal. Um, so let's see, what did people answer to this question? Yeah, lots. It's, that's a high number. So a lot of more than a hundred non-native species of plants and animals. That's a lot of species. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Most people answering twenty-one to a hundred. I think I would probably have answered that too, including plants and animals. Very cool. All right. Thanks for that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that I like to say about observing plants specifically is it's really important to slow down and look closer. And that's kind of what this hand lens is all about too. Um, because some of the things, the really, really interesting and exciting things that happen with plants are very small and can easily be overlooked. So on this leaf, you might see a little speck on one of the veins here. And that is actually a monarch butterfly egg. Um, and it would be so easy to pass that by if you didn't know what you were looking for. But when you spend time and just carefully, you know, flip those leaves over, um, you might find something really exciting. And I know a lot of people do end up finding surprises in their garden, shall we say. Next slide, please. So here's one of the, these such surprises that um, actually Pete and I observed in his garden last year. And this was a morel mushroom, um, which is not really something that I would have expected to see in a suburban neighborhood in downtown Toronto, but there it was growing off of decomposing matter in the soil. And again, you had to get sort of right down there and sort of move things aside before you could really see it. But that's just what biologists do, right? We get our hands dirty. We, we're not afraid to, uh, to really get in there and take a close look at stuff um, and spend the time. It's really about spending time in there. You will find fascinating things in your garden if you spend enough time. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm passing over to Pete. Thank you. Ryan, and I have to say, I did eat two of those morels. They were delicious. It was my bonus from an urban garden. Unbelievable. Anyway, I, as a Arctic and marine and whale and bird ecologist, get to talk about invertebrates. <laughs> and of course, I've transformed myself to realize that nothing at the top of the food chain happens unless the bottom of the food chain is there. And of course, as Yamila said, we've deconstructed our connected intact ecosystems um, and so we have to start at the bottom and put them back and that's what this entire program is we can restore this for all the benefits we looked at so in terms of the gardens that you're increasingly going to be restoring of course invertebrates are actually quite easy uh, they don't fly away like swans and eagles um, in Ben's garden, but you can quite often at the right plants, the right time of year, see an amazing variety of uh, insects. And I've just been blown away by exactly what Yomelo says. You plant something within hours of it flowering. Oh my God, where did that species come from? What is it? So there are many tools uh, to do this as Ryan uh, alluded to. I mean, that abbot sphinx moth is enormous. It's like five inches across, so I didn't really need the microscope. But you will need the microscope if you're really getting into this and nerdy and want to know about the bristle hairs on roots of some of these plants or on the thigh of a sweat bee, etc. 
And some people really get addicted uh, with this and they're not just crazy scientists. So next slide, please. There are many different techniques here, obviously. Um, but beyond the how to, I think the key question is why? Why would somebody do this? Well, we'll see later on why it's actually in your best interest uh, because to keep a record and find out a bit more about what's going on in your garden, because that really informs what you decide to do in response to some of the changes that nature and other things bring to bear on your garden. But the the reality this, both of these flowers are within one year of planting and you know once you start to get a bit curious and you use your binoculars turned the wrong way up like mine or a lens you'll quite easily nowadays be able to identify what the species is and you know then you start asking questions of yourself you come home from work and you say well i wonder what's going to be on that plant today so uh, on the right there, it's the Hoary Mountain Mint, which you can use in your kitchen as well. But suddenly you see a new species of bumblebee there. And I still don't know what that one in the middle is at the top. I submitted my um, image and recording through the iNaturalist app. And soon some expert will get back to me and give me a clue as to what it is. But, you know, that's fantastic because, you know, I, I will eventually find out what it is and, you know, how how it's doing and what the experts say uh, I ought to look out for next. Next slide. Of course, all of those pollinators are hugely important. And I'm sure most of you are fully aware of uh, the need to just keep increasing the number of native pollinator species, which are, are uh, really the main source of pollination for the world's plants, including the ones we eat. To keep hold of your garden, it's pretty crucial to know what's going on, pay attention to the uh, invasive species of plants and the invasive and alien species of insects. And there are many tens of species of invasive insects, some of which are devastating uh, the timber industry throughout Southern Canada and many crops and many other things and those are direct or indirect imports of course um, caused by our human mobility but the, this particular image is of the uh, now infamous Japanese beetle here it's demolishing uh, the invasive uh, wild grapevine and uh, but they can also demolish a lot of other species including native ones so once you find you know a few of these Japanese beetles um, it's a great idea to uh, start controlling them in your garden. Otherwise they can really uh, cause huge damage. There's a couple of websites there, which are wonderful collations of information on the different uh, invertebrate um, pest invasive species and some tips and connections as to how to uh, control them. Of course, these native plant gardens um, that we advocate don't use toxic chemicals, but there are many soapy water and hand picking uh, techniques for controlling those species. But it's remarkable how many of these alien insects you do see when you start looking under the leaves and in the stems. Next slide. So another one of the really popular things, both at local schools, but in any family, any street, any summer um, discourse, people will start talking about the colorful butterflies. And then of course, somebody will say, I had a monarch caterpillar eating my parsley. And of course, they are to be forgiven for that because in the middle there, you can see the similarities between the stripy monarch caterpillar there I counted 15 monarch caterpillars on one little butterfly milkweed that we just planted two weeks before up at Yorkdale Mall and they demolished the plant. <laughs> they love, love it. But of course it looks rather similar to the black swallowtail caterpillar. And I was more than happy to sacrifice two of my six parsley uh, plants and they uh, went off and uh, pupated and became butterflies. But those are great things. You can count the caterpillars. You can actually um, enhance the survival as they pupate. Uh, next slide. And you can actually, using um, 
citizen science where you were recording the the return dates, the first returns of monarchs or the last departures of monarchs, those are all iNaturalist, really useful uh, information that allows through North America, uh, the kind of um, diagrams on the left, uh, people can trace not only the, the routes, but the timing of those migrations back and forth over the four generations of the monarch cycle. And then in the main window there, I put uh, the tagging and it was uh, Canadians, the Urquhart's who actually first did this. They put tiny little tags onto these monarchs to try and answer the question, where do they go? Because nobody knew until about 40 years ago. And then they found they all winter in this high altitude uh, moist forest near Mexico City. And people still do tag these monarchs and some people can re-trap them on their migration routes and scientists can tell a lot. And uh, some of my neighbors actually through Monarch Watch, there's the website, monarchwatch.org, um, you can become a monarch razor and uh, tag applier and you can contribute to the migration um, studies for monarchs. So all important parts of safeguarding really the world's most spectacular insect migration. All from your garden upwards. Next slide. And my final little story uh, is a bit like Ben's there, but uh, in the course of starting my native plant back garden, I suddenly saw these guys and eventually discovered it was the large milkweed bug. And they seemed to sit there the whole summer on the milkweed plants. In fact, I had 10 times more large milkweed bugs than I did monarch caterpillars. And, you know, they produced young and then it got to October and they were hatching and they love butterfly milkweed seeds. And okay, I was collecting all these numbers and eventually I thought, well, where do these things go? I looked up online, winters in the Caribbean. I thought, how on earth do these things in October, this little beetle, how does it get from here to the Caribbean? So I called up Chris Darling at the Royal Ontario Museum. And he said, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Nobody knows. These are fairly common uh, little beetles. They're a hemipteran bug actually. And he said, why don't, why don't you start a project and try and find out how they survive the winter? Do they all fly down to Mexico with the monarchs? And so there it is, it's still an unsolved mystery. And to me, that's a huge part of the discovery and motivation in your own backyard or even on a milkweed plant in your balcony. So huge amount of fun and well-being around this. Next slide. Over to Ben. Thanks, Pete. Yes, I can't wait to hear that, that mystery for sure. And I know a lot of people with Japanese beetle issues, um, if they have a rural place or the city permits it, they feed them to their chickens and they convert them into eggs that they collect every day. So all sorts of ways, especially nowadays um, that we're looking at combining uh, foods in with our gardens. So when we look at monitoring, uh, Pete was kind to give me these slides. I spent a lot of my career working with reptiles and amphibians. And there are so many different options, whether it's the Federation of Ontario Naturalists that has a program um, that they do a survey every few years, or it's uh, Bird Studies Canada will do one called Marsh Monitoring Program. There's the opportunity really to make an impact. And one example I would use is a young volunteer who came to me when I worked on Pelee Island for over a decade studying primarily the blue racer snake, which is only found on Pelee Island in Canada. This volunteer was a few years younger than me. He didn't have any formal education, but he had desire, desire, passion, and an incredible ability to help us record and capture. And before long, one of the local conservation authorities hired him. And uh, after a while, they moved him right up the ranks. And I'm not suggesting everybody has to do this professionally. They, they helped him get an education. And now he's one of the top uh, scientists at uh, Upper Thames Region Conservation Authority, making a huge impact. So, and, and then there's another person who grew up in London, Ontario, who is now a scientist as well, um, Will Van Hemmesen. 
uh, with iNaturalist, he is every year for the last few years is the top contributor. This is an amateur con contribution that he does for free. He will identify in excess of, I think, 25,000 plant entries for people using iNaturalist because they go to the professionals. So there's so much room for you to make an impact here. And again, you don't have to be an expert. Um, any little contribution is great. Even with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, if there's a species at risk, we rented a cottage last summer in Georgian Bay. Uh, it was a beautiful, actually it was closer to, to Gravenhurst. So it was east of Georgian Bay. Um, I was supposed to be off work and I was, but of course I have to turn over rocks and look for things because that's what I'm trained in. An Eastern hognose snake was right at the cottage. Uh, one hadn't been seen there in 15 years. So I, I recorded this with the Ministry of Natural Resources. So we can make an impact. Next slide. Emily, next slide. Yeah, so um, if you've been in, involved in a couple of the, the webinars so far, you've, you've become familiar with this wetland. This is in my backyard. It took a, a while to uh, construct. Um, I'm constantly tinkering with it. Uh, it is a magnet, not just for things like reptiles and amphibians, but you know things like salamanders as well, frogs. Um, also turtles will come in. I've only ever had uh, garter snakes, whereas there could be two or three other species, but I'm fairly landlocked within the city. But because of that running water there, and I know I'm largely on uh, reptiles and amphibians here, this running water in the springtime will attract migrating songbirds. And uh, it is pretty spectacular to see some of them. If you are a birder or a bird watcher, either a, you know, really experienced or just starting out, if you've had the opportunity to go somewhere like Long Point or Rondeau or Point Pelee or Pelee Island, you may have experienced a good day, like a great day where you will see hundreds, if not thousands of songbirds. It's just overwhelming. Not very often do you get to see this, but like what Pete said earlier in, um, in this webinar, it just warms your heart and it excites you. I, I happen to see 10 warblers here one morning, uh, black throated blue on the little trickle. They listen for that sound and they slow down. And if it's the right time at about four or five o'clock in the morning, they will come in and they will start to uh, drink early in the morning and then look for insects to feed. And the more native plants you have, the more opportunity you will have to get these. And of course, uh, there are a lot of people um, online um, sharing rare observations, or again, with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Uh, one year, fairly early on here, the rarest bird I had was called the Kentucky Warbler, which has a very distinctive call. It, it actually uh, breeds up in the, the subarctic. Um, incredible story of this bird. Uh, so wetlands like this, whether it's wet reptiles, amphibians, birds, it really draws them in and gives you the opportunity to contribute your records. Next slide. Yeah, so there are so many different things that you can count. Um, and some of the, the species that were really common when I was a kid and I grew up on a farm, but those barn swallows that you see there would often fall out of the nest and I would you know, try to get them back up in the nest. We raised a few that we couldn't get back up there. There are programs for all of these things. And one really good one that the website that you could go to is the Cornell University. It has a, a, a thing called All About Birds. It would help you identify and learn more about birds, but they have many programs that you could sign up with across North America. Uh, screech owls, um, like in addition to um, local bird counts, there's the Christmas bird count. Um, I'm very fortunate to have had a pair of screech owls nest in my backyard. So we had three owlets um, a number of years ago and they're back this year. And I keep hearing them now every night. Um, nut hatches are something pretty common, uh, really some incredible opportunities. And it varies depending on the time of the year as well. Next slide. And some other things that you might not consider counting, um, 
there's a, a picture on the right there that's showing a film that you can get because birds have a tendency to fly into windows. And uh, when I was living on Pelee Island doing the snake research, uh, one of the, the neighbors called me and said, I have a yellow bird that hit my window. And I said, you know, I, I, was, I was quite busy and I thought, oh, a yellow bird, a goldfinch, um, maybe a yellow war warbler. Sure enough, it was a female prothonotary warbler. At that time, we only had about 15 nests in all of Canada. And now I think we have even fewer. So this bird was just in shock and I was able to take it in and feed it for a few days. Uh, so these are things that are really important to count and not just really rare endangered species like that. We wanna know the type of impact. If you look at that center photograph there, um, if you have a cat and you let it go outside and it doesn't have a bell, uh, so that birds and mice and other rodents can't hear it. Um, it will, and if it has claws, it will catch things and kill them. And one estimate that I've, I've brought up a, a number of years now is that our estimated uh, 20 million feral cats, so cats that we allow to go outside, will kill about a billion songbirds a year. So it's something that somebody has counted and is something that is uh, still continues to have a major impact. So you know, we really encourage you to make sure your cats are either declawed or have a bell or just stay inside. Um, other things that you can count uh, certainly include bird feeders. Uh, what are the number of species that you're getting? This can be helpful during a Christmas bird count or if you happen to um, be overlapping in what's called a breeding bird atlas, which occurs every four years in Ontario, then you can add your, your sightings from your feeder and Pete, maybe if you could come on again there and remind me the bottom left, is this for bees? Yeah, water baths like that for birds or even a small trough can be very helpful uh, for uh, any animal in the garden, especially through the summer. But those are also good places to, to count things yeah. at because they're concentrated. Like exactly. an African buffalo watering hole in the Serengeti. <laughs> <laughs> or in downtown Toronto, you never know. Some strange things turn up. Okay, next slide. Wasn't there a monkey at uh, one of the uh, stores in a few years ago, right? So this one here is talking about some of the, the food webs that we can see and observe and recognize that, you know, someone asked earlier and I answered, how can I get more birds to come to my yard? They were here, but now they're gone. And um, they're likely gone because the birds that you had feeding on the seeds are, are now on to some things that are coming up. And certainly the migrating birds um, will be looking for insects. And even birds when they're, they're breeding, if they're typically a seed eater, they will shift to insects to get a higher protein. But what we're looking at here is a really interesting food web of the white elm, which will actually attract the coronamid, which is a, a midge, or some people call them muffleheads that are found in big water bodies. Some species are found in creeks, but in Toronto, they certainly are in Lake Ontario. They'll come out and they will go to the trees such as the white elm. And when you have species like the pine warbler, which is a beautiful, it's got an incredible long, long call and if you have binoculars and you can learn to use them because it's not as easy as you think these birds flit around pretty quickly so you have to be pretty patient and kind on yourself because often you'll as soon as you bring them up to your your eyes they move so once you get that established you'll realize that these migrating pine warblers are actually going for the insects that are in the white elm and so it really is an important thing to continually bring these native species which attract insects so much more than the non-native species. Next slide, please. And that's the white elm on the right in leaf. And pass it over to Yarmila. Thanks, Ben. So as your native plant garden expands and matures, you'll definitely see a lot of the species that Ben just talked about, the insects and birds. Um, maybe if you're lucky, you'll also get some wetland species, but you'll also see a lot more mammals. And in our area, red squirrels and raccoons are the most common. And uh, seeing evidence of their um, comings and goings in your yard is another aspect of monitoring. You can see their paw prints in the snow in the winter and 
you know, evidence of scat and other activity. Um, but that's, that's good. That's good news. You're building habitat for them to use and um, interact with and, and shelter in. Uh, you might see them foraging around. Yeah, you might also see them digging up your plants. Um, but we don't want you to feel discouraged about that. Uh, there are things that you can do to uh, protect your plants from um, digging. You can put some fine mesh chicken wire over uh, new seedlings that you've planted, or you can put plastic coils and other wraps around your trees and shrubs to protect them from, from little nibbles that might otherwise affect their growth. Next slide, please. Okay, so the In the Zone Garden Tracker. And I think we have a poll. Is, is that right, Emily? Do we have the poll ready to go? No? Okay, there we go. Just wanted to get a quick snapshot of everyone online if you've had a chance to use our In the Zone Garden Tracker. So we're going to be talking about some of the ways that you can input your information into that and um, other benefits from the tracker. Tracker has been collecting data for us for about three years now and uh, we're really excited to share that out with you a little bit during this presentation. All right, aha, okay, perfect. So we have about a third of you have used the garden tracker and two thirds have not. So um, that's really interesting for me to hear. Um, and I'll get into uh, the, the basics of it in a slide or two. But first, um, if you haven't already visited our website, do take a look around on it. Um, it's there at the bottom of each slide. And uh, you can discover some of the uh, really wonderful resources that we've put together over the last several years. Uh, you can see the garden guides on the screen here. We also have some how-to uh, pamphlets and um, videos that you can refer to. We have sourcing guides and plant lists. And um, all of those things will help you really figure out the best way to start in the um, building the habitat that is best suited for, for your conditions. So if you haven't had a chance yet, do check it out and um, that will help lead you in the right direction. Next slide, please. In my opinion, what makes the In the Zone program really unique though is our um, online garden tracker tool, which is a really important aspect of this program because it allows us to tell that story of restoration and it allows us to demonstrate the collective impact of all of the gardens that are registered on the tracker. Uh, you can start using the tracker at any time, but the best time is actually before you even plant your first native plant. And that allows you to set your baseline. Um, and then as time goes on and you, um, you know, add more plants and uh, make other changes in your garden, then these are all recorded and you can see how your garden changes over time. So that's a really neat aspect of the garden tracker. You can go in and um, answer just sort of the top level questions at first and then um, once you get more experience and, and um, items to add in you can go and answer some of those uh, digger uh, sort of questions that dig a little bit more deeply um, and what is also great about all the information that we collate is that we do report back to our members on what we're seeing through each um, uh, through each newsletter edition that comes out uh, roughly on a monthly basis. So we try to reflect that back to the users and see how their uh, work is um, improving and impacting things. Next slide, please. Uh, I think it's really important to note that the Garden Tracker is voluntary, it is confidential and science-based, and the information that is collected can be 
uh, grouped under sort of three broad buckets. The first one is biological. So we look at habitat connectivity, um, wildlife sightings. So many of the things that we've been talking about during this webinar can be recorded in the garden tracker. Uh, we also look at uh, climate change uh, related items such as you know shade uh, created by trees, water and energy savings. But we also look at community connections. So this is back to that um, emotional connection that people have with their gardens and with nature in general. Um, how they like to share their, their gardening experiences. And all of that really rolls up into a fairly unique um, look at what is happening in the, in the zone gardens that are part of the garden tracker. Next slide, please. And again, back to the data a little bit. So we have 3,000, just over 3,000 gardens now registered. And some of the things that we know about them is that a third of them already include native plants, even before um, you know, joining the program. There are lots of people gardening with native plants, which is great. Lots more native plants that can be put in still. We also know that 91% of the gardeners feel connected to nature through their garden, and they want to grow more native plants because they know how important they are for wildlife. We also know that 68% of the gardens are connected to adjacent habitat. And this is really important, especially in densely urban and peri-urban areas where the uh, wildlife really needs that extra help uh, moving through the habitat. And if there are green corridors that can uh, connect it to other green areas, whether it's parks or uh, ravines or other protected areas and other gardens, that's really important. Next slide, please. I think I'm handing that back to Ryan now. That's me, and I'll be real quick because we're coming up to time and we want to get to your questions. Let's get the next slide, please. Just very fast. Um, really all I want to say here is that one of the most exciting things about monitoring and reacting in your garden is the changes that happen over time. As you notice, how some plants do well in some areas and less well in other areas, or maybe they even move over to the places that they like best. And as you see that every year is a little bit different and you learn and grow and start infusing your little decision-making processes into the garden, it becomes like an expression, an extension of yourself and your personality. And so I just, I love to see that aspect of these native plant gardens, how, how each individual gardener and steward is reflected in their own um, space. That's all I'll say here for now. Next slide, please. We'll pass it back to Pete. Oh, Pete, you're on mute. Yep, such a quiet guy I am. I would encourage you to go to inaturalist.org and these um, wonderful satellite websites and links are there and you can, whatever you're interested in, if it's bumblebee watch or butterflies or birds or snakes or, or mammals, you can find useful things to do that make a big difference and help contribute to citizen science data sets, but also ID guides and or quite often some local and regional initiatives that you might even uh, find some new friends with. Next slide. That's just a sample of wonderful things with my little phone that I took in my backyard and totally um, inspiring. Next slide. So in summary, uh, we hope we've given you a flavor for some of these main elements here, but it really is just a, an entry point. The websites are right now for Southern Ontario and for a few other parts of Southern Canada, fairly well populated with some good resources. Next slide. Those are some of the books that uh, we for refer to quite a lot. Next slide is the web-based equivalents ID and citizen science. Again, you can refer back to this. The recording will be posted, so don't sharpen your pencil up right now. <laughs> Next slide. 
And more, more than anything, this is the time of year, particularly this year when people are really quite confined and restricted. Make more use of your garden, go discover it. Take away some of that grass and that concrete and ash sprout and just put in a few of these plants and you will, you will get the bug if you excuse the pun. Make a difference, thank you. My oh, great, thank you so much, Pete. And thank you to our experts for giving that great presentation on citizen science. If you have any questions for our panel, you can see their email addresses right here and you can get in touch with them by email and you'll get a response. And um, before we jump into your questions, I just want to take a moment to remind everybody that we have two more webinars coming up in this series. Um, on Saturday, Ryan and Lorraine Johnson are going to be talking about edible native plants. And then we're going to have Dr. Doug Talami give us um, a presentation about his new book and how you can help create wildlife corridors. So you can find those on our website, wwf.ca you'll see a Garden for Wildlife box on our homepage. And if you've missed previous episodes and you'd like to join them, you can go to youtube.com slash WWF Canada and we'll have them posted there 48 hours later. All right, so let's dive into some of the questions that we have. And the first question is for Pete. Since it's summer is coming up and even currently right now, a lot of students are home from school, how can you best get kids involved in citizen science activities? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I'm sure virtually everybody here can see and feel the energy levels of these poor cooped up kids. And this is just convenient timing because, you know, their world is dominated by these uh, iPhone devices. And really, once you've got uh, a source of nectar or pollen, something, even a dandelion, if you sit beside it and do nothing for a few minutes, it's on a warmish, sunny day, something will come along, snap a picture, get them into iNaturalist and get them asking questions and, you know, take them to another plant and they can see a different kind of species. And it, they're a captive audience right now for actually coming into contact with something that's real. The other thing that I say is, is really good for kids because most of us were raised that way is get some dirt under your fingernails. <laughs> Dig, do something with plants and it feels good to be down actually touching the earth. It's not in a rectangular screen, it's real. Great, thank you so much, Pete. And we have a question now about milkweed. Um, should I save the milkweed by spraying with soapy water or leave the aphids be? We want to help the monarchs, um, but they aren't going to come if the plants are eaten. Do you want to take yeah, this one, Ryan? I will. And I saw a number of questions along these lines, and it is certainly true that um, milkweed plants very often, even on my balcony, how did they get up here, uh, will be covered in these oleander aphids, which are an exotic um, species, actually escaped from greenhouses. Typically, they have that um, bright orange color to them. Um, now, there are a few ways that you can do this. Um, one, is, one thing to note is that the oleander aphids will very rarely actually destroy the plant. Um, it's likely that they, by sort of sapping the, the energy out of that um, plant, you may get fewer flowers, fewer fruits, but the plant will likely persist and probably even monarchs um, and their, their caterpillars will still be able to persist on there. However, you're right that it would be great to sort of be able to get rid of them. A few options that exist. I used a toothbrush <laughs> and uh, manually sort of brushed them away. And I had to do that about once a week. It was a nice little meditation out there on the balcony. Um, for, if you have more, you can blast them with a hose. Yeah, there we go, Pete. <laughs> um, so if you set your hose nozzle setting to sort of an intermediate intensity, you can get it to a point where it's not damaging the plant, but you can sort of hold the plant up blast it like a car wash and that'll blast most of those aphids off. You'll obviously want to be very careful if you do have eggs or caterpillars in that case. Um, I would personally avoid any kind of soap or chemicals if you are particularly concerned about monarchs because anything that's going to harm the aphids is likely to also harm those uh, caterpillars. So those are your, your options. 
Of course, it's best of all, though, is if the ladybugs and their larvae show up, which they did do on my condo property last year, and then they just go absolutely hmm. bonkers. They will, they will eat like hundreds. Each larva, it goes crazy. It's really fascinating to watch. <laughs> That's awesome, Ryan. It just really shows that every insect has its place in the ecosystem. Um, we have another question here um, that says, I've been using the iNaturalist app as well as picture this. It is hard for iNaturalist to identify my location. Um, is there any way someone is going to update the application so we can type in a location um, where PictureVis allows you to punch that in? Um, ben, do you want to take this one? Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. I, I actually lost the audio. Could you repeat the second half of that question? Yes. So it's about the iNaturalist app and how somebody can't type in their location. Is that something that you think the app is going to update soon? Well, that's, that's hard to say. I know they're constantly coming out with new versions that you're supposed to download. So I, I, you know, I, I would think that that's possible, but I know that um, in a lot of the work that I do in Long Point, which is on the North shores of Lake Erie, I live in London. It takes me about an hour and a half to drive there. And I've been doing it for 15 years. And every single time when I'm on a cell phone call, there are three or four areas that the call drops. And so it's, it's sometimes related to things that are not related to the app. Um, but I'm not saying that's the case in, in this I, would, I can just add, I actually was going through photographs for this slide presentation yesterday, and certainly the new version of iNaturalist um, pinpointed my house, and that is geo-referenced for my uh, mystery B ID. So I think they may be aware of this and upgrading. That's Great. good to know. So I have a question for you, Pete. Um, you mentioned Bumblebee Watch earlier in the presentation. Can you tell us a little bit more about Bumblebee Watch and how people can get involved with that? Yeah, the uh, it's it's a sub uh, set of the Xerces X E R C E S satellite dot uh, org. That was one of the icons on my slide, and um, you can go through that. And for bumblebees, I mean Canada has forty species of bumblebees actually from coast to coast to coast and just submit your observations and learn how to identify them. And um, next Wednesday, I'm hosting with Sheila Collar, one of Canada's top bumblebee experts. She's one of the experts doing the ID from people submitted records. Um, she's at York University and we're collaborating with her on a number of things. So that's how this works. And bumblebees, of course, are the most efficient pollinators and very uh, familiar to Canadians. And so, yeah, plenty resources and you, helpful things you can uh, key your obs observations into uh, with Bumblebee Watch. Great. And the thing that Pete was talking about with the bumblebees is one of our Wildlife Wednesdays, which happens on Facebook Wednesdays. And this one will be at 3 p.m. next week. So you can tune in on Facebook. So we have a question here about aphids and whether, I'm guessing, whether we should encourage prey mantises. Ben, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, I, I think it was more of a suggestion. And um, there are some species uh, that aren't native, like praying mantises aren't native to Ontario, to most of Canada. Um, I, actually, I think to all of Canada, but um, they're generally accepted. Like there are some plants even like, uh, one's called Herb Robert, which is a tiny little geranium. It's a beautiful little thing. It's in a lot of our woodlands in Southern Canada. It's not native, but it's kind of accepted because it's not super invasive and it doesn't really restrict the growth of other species. So I, I'm a bit of an advocate for people kind of exploring. If you're in a fallow field somewhere and you get to learn what um, a praying mantis egg case looks like, it looks like a little piece of foam, it's like this. Usually there are dozens of them in the field. If you have a place that has enough habitat to support a couple hundred baby praying mantises coming out in March, you could take one of these little foam things that looks like a wine cork and um, you could actually um, put it in your backyard. And remember of the 200 that come out, only a few will make it to adulthood and they have to feed on other insects, small ones, 
to then medium ones to large ones. So you're going to need a good habitat and thus ecosystem to support them. Um, they're beautiful to have around. They're really pretty and they don't really impact too much. So I'm, I'm all for, yeah, get some praying mantises. That's awesome. And can you tell us a bit more about how you could also attract um, ladybugs? You mentioned the ladybugs are good for aphids as well. How do you get those? You're oh, still muted, Ben. Usually it's how to get rid of ladybugs um, because they, they come in really big numbers and it depends mm -hmm. on the year. Um, but, you know, they, they will feed on all sorts of things from, you know, any of those plants that, uh, that we've seen. Do you want to add to this, Pete, Brian? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, those insect fluctuations uh, in a naturally balanced world are, are normal. There's highs and lows. But unfortunately, in urban, peri-urban areas, the most common infestation of ladybugs is actually the little orange Chinese ladybug. I forget its Latin name, but that's the thing that stops you opening your car windows in August because you get like 300 blowing into your screen. And that's because it didn't evolve here and its natural predators um, didn't come with it. And so it's gangbusters. So there's a, as for bees, you know, the honeybee has disrupted some of the native bee thing. And so this Chinese ladybugs disrupted. Mm -hmm. Not all ladybugs are equal. And I just wanted to add that, that I, it turned out that those, it was the orange Asian lady beetles that I got on my milkweeds and the larvae, you know, those are the ones that are introduced into greenhouses to eat the oleander aphids that escaped. <laughs> but then the Asian lady beetles also escaped and somehow both of them managed to find their way to my balcony. So I don't know quite what's going on there, but I do love all the questions. I just wanted to say all of you ecosystem engineers out there who are thinking about how do I attract this and how do I, how can I bring this into my garden? And that's absolutely, it's a very cool way to be thinking and it's, it, you're on the right track for sure. All I'll say about that is that, you know, as stewards and ecosystem engineers, um, really what we can do is change the, the basic variables, we can tune them a little bit here and there. We can put the right plants in, we can change the density, things like that. And then when it comes to attracting particular species, that's really sort of up to the whims of nature to decide what's going to show up um, in your habitat. But all I would say is just build the best, most biodiverse habitat you possibly can and marvelous things will happen. Great, thank you so much for answering that. And I have a couple of questions here for Yarmila. The first one is, who can join the In the Zone Tracker? Whose information are we looking for to contribute to that citizen science database? Thanks, Emily, that's a great question. And uh, it's actually open to everybody. We welcome everybody to join. We, uh, You don't have to live in the Carolinian zone to participate um, in the, uh, the garden tracker. The questions are broad enough to um, allow anybody from across Canada uh, to join. Um, we've even had some international folks join in. So um, we're happy to see everybody um, you know, start recording and monitoring their, their garden data. Thank you. And you mentioned on our last webinar that you've been gardening with native plants for just about three years now. What advice would you give people who are feeling overwhelmed when they're starting out with citizen science? Um, well, I would say uh, talk to friends and, and colleagues who are already doing a lot of plant, uh, native plant gardening. There are a well of information and you'll get lots of tips and tricks from them. And really the best advice though, is just to experiment, um, do a little bit of reading about what, um, what your habitat's like and what would naturally occur there, but also don't be afraid to, um, you know, put in a variety of plants and see what does well and, and just track what, what's, what's, um, taking over your garden and what's not coming back after the first season. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's very rewarding. And then, of course, you layer on top of that um, the species that you can start seeing. And um, yeah, 
uh, using any of these apps to help ID the um, the birds or the bugs uh, that you're you're seeing is very helpful because then once you know their name and and a little bit about them you you really get that you know more of a bond with uh, what you're seeing in your garden. Great, thank you so much, Ayamila. And I'm going to put a question to just all of our panelists before we wrap things up. If you could give your one best piece of advice about citizen science or your favorite citizen science story. Hmm, that's a wild card, Emily, okay. Yeah. I've got, I'll start off. Um, my advice is just photograph everything. <laughs> just take pictures of literally everything that you see. And I have in this process developed this archive of all of the biodiversity that I've seen and and because everything is time and location stamped I can start comparing things from year to year and place to place and uh, it just starts with one photo and you know whenever I'm out I just take the time to slow down everyone's annoyed that the botanist needs to take a picture of this little weird grass but then there it is in my archive and I, I don't regret it so try that <laughs> yeah Thanks, Ryan. I, it's a good piece of advice. I would add it's it's not necessarily a citizen science thing, but um, for starting out, um, don't pull anything unless you're absolutely certain. And you can be using iNaturalist or whatever to identify things. But I know in the very beginning, I didn't know about eliosomes, which are the fleshy little food offerings that are on the seeds of woodland plants like trilliums and bloodroot and uh, bell warts. Um, ants move them around in your garden and actually plant them in suitable locations because they, they benefit mutually from doing so. And so I was pulling out a lot of the baby um, bloodroot plants that were coming up because I was just really on a mission to have this manicured native plant garden. And of course, once I realized I was kind of hurt because it would have helped fill it in so much quicker. And of course, you know, um, nature um, which we are a part of, but if we're talking about it a little separately in terms of the garden itself, it does a, a much better job uh, than us in terms of, you know, recovering and, and bringing back a lot of the native plants to a space that's been barren of them for decades, if not hundreds of years. So from my point of view, I think that when you dedicate yourself to um, you know, participating in monitoring and citizen science, it helps you really focus more on your garden and you actually do tend to notice the little things that you might have missed before because you're making a real effort to, to notice things. And that's, um, that's really important because A, you will notice them um, if you're more careful, uh, but also again, it, it builds that, um, that uh, connection to your space, your uh, garden and what it's doing in the grander sort of landscape and how it connects to the, the area around it. And I, it's so much easier to try to convince and, and tell people how you, they should, um, you know, in, interact with our garden when you have that firsthand knowledge of what that brings to you. So. Um, that would be that would be my advice. Notice all the little things because everything is significant. Well, that's a nice. great question. Thanks for finishing it off this way, Emily. So I'll answer and then I'm going to throw the microphone to you. You can answer the same question. But <laughs> for me, actually, this is spontaneous. It's building on what my three good colleagues said, which is actually because on this particular um, webinar, just over half of you uh, haven't aren't an in the zone member. So you're relatively new, uh, I would assume, to the native plants thing. And the big, the big trick here is the magic and the mystery that comes through the examination of what's actually happening, i.e. citizen science. And so compared to a garden with lawn or interlocking and concrete, there's so much of nature's magic and mystery at play if we only stop to just look patiently and closely at it. It's just wondrous what's happening right under our noses, but only once we get into the more progressive type of gardening, which is what we're doing within the zone. So there's a lot of discovery, folks. <laughs> That's the biggest thing 
and have fun. Emily. Okay, my experience with citizen science, I don't know if I have a great piece of advice, but I can say that when I was a little kid, we used to go in the backyard at night to watch bats. It was, it was all about bats mm -hmm. and I know that their populations are declining. So one year I actually went to Hyde Park where you can take out these, I guess, machines. I'm not sure what the looking for bats and locate them and then contribute that information to kind of like a bat count. So that's my personal experience with citizen science. It was very fun. It was like a late night bat walk. And with that, I'd just like to thank everybody who tuned in, tuned in today for joining us and learning a bit more about citizen science. We really hope that you will try the garden tracker and help us learn more about the urban biodiversity that is in your neighborhood. And join us again on Saturday for our next webinar. Like to bye bye, thanks. everyone. All right. Bye. Thank you, all. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.